All right, this is a continuation of Chapter 18 for STEM Biology, Section 2, Ecology of Organisms. First thing we need to understand is what a habitat is. A habitat is obviously a place where an organism lives. Picking of an organism's habitat depends on evolutionary history of the organism, the organism's abilities, and its needs. For example, these are two examples of habitats. All right, what are the components of an ecosystem? From last section, we learned an ecosystem is composed of the organisms that live there and the non-living components of the ecosystem. So we got terms for this. They're called biotic and abiotic factors. Biotic are the living components of the ecosystem. Abiotic are the non-living components or factors that influence organisms in an ecosystem. Here's examples of abiotic factors. They're usually weather related, like climate, sunlight, and pH. Abiotic factors can change. They're not constant. They can change from place to place and over time. Some organisms can adjust their tolerance to these abiotic factors through the process of homeostasis. So, are these abiotic or biotic? Obviously, a fish is biotic. Our tornado is abiotic. Water in the cliffs is abiotic, where this coral is biotic. Okay, let's watch this. An organism's environment includes anything that affects the organism. The environment can be divided into two classes. Biotic factors are the living components of the environment and the organic matter they produce. For example, the plants and animals in a river, as well as dead leaves from the plants, are biotic factors in the river environment. Abiotic factors are the physical, non-living components of the environment. For example, the water, the rocks, the air, and the sunlight are abiotic factors in the river environment. Okay. Each organism is able to survive within a limited range of these environmental conditions. This range can be determined by measuring how efficient the organism performs at different conditions. Like temperature. A certain temperature that organism could be at its peak, you know, its peak performance. And at other temperatures it might be slow and sluggish, for example. A graph of this type of performance is called a tolerance curve. Organisms can adjust their tolerance to abiotic factors through acclimation. Organisms within a lifetime of the organism. So here's an example of a tolerance curve. This is for goldfish at 25 degrees Celsius. They're acclimated to a higher temperatures. They, they have a higher swimming speed at higher temperatures. Um, so they have a different tolerance curve than the five degree fish. You can see they're, they're acclimated only to their highest speed would be at about 32, you know, um, they're 32 centimeters per second and their peak is at about 15 degrees Celsius. So this example of a tolerance curve. All right, controlling internal conditions. Environments obviously fluctuate in temperature, light, moisture, salinity, which is salt. Um, and other factors. Organisms can deal with these changes in two different ways. Conformers are organisms that do not regulate their internal conditions. They change as their external environment changes. For example, cold, this is the same thing as cold-blooded, being cold-blooded. Cold-blooded animals like reptiles are the exact temperature as their environment. They do not regulate it inside, internally. Where regulators use energy to control the internal conditions. And these are warm-blooded animals like us. We maintain 98.6 degrees no matter how hot or cold it is outside. Um, here's examples of escaping from unsuitable conditions. Hibernation. They can become dormant or they will migrate and go south for the winter. Okay. Another concept for Section 2 is the niche. A niche is the way of life or the role of the organism in an ecosystem. Organisms will have more than one niche in their lifetime. A fundamental niche is the most ideal niche an organism can have. Um, niches can overlap between two species. A realized niche is the actual niche an organism occupies. The niche of a species includes its habitat, food, and predators as well as the species with which it competes. When studying the niche of a species, scientists usually concentrate on a few readily measured features, such as where it feeds or the size of its prey. In this graph, 
Dark blue indicates the feeding height and prey length most frequently selected by one bird species. The term fundamental niche describes the full range of conditions a species can tolerate and the resources it can use. The fundamental niche of one species might overlap with that of another species. For example, two species might both be able to use the same type of shelter or might both be able to eat the same kind of prey. The term realized niche describes the resources and conditions the species actually uses. Realized niches cannot overlap. While two species might both be able to use a certain type of shelter, for example, they cannot occupy it at the same time. Okay, generalists are species with broad niches. Um, these type of species can tolerate a range of conditions and they use a variety of resources. An example is the Virginia opossum, which is pictured there. It is found throughout the United States and it will feed on almost anything. So it's very broad niche. In contrast, the specialist. Specialists are species that have narrow niches and have specific areas of residence and specific eating habits. For example, you got these koala bears and their babies. They are found in Australia and they only feed on specific trees, the eucalyptus um, tree and those, those leaves on that tree. They're very specific, very narrow niche specialists. And that finishes our podcast for section two.